All right, guys. So it's uh, no big secret that we are surrounded by smart devices these days. But uh, have you ever stopped to wonder how these everyday items got so smart in the first place? Well, for the next half hour or so, we're going to chat about the Internet of Things, commonly referred to as IoT. And I hope to help you better understand how we all got so smart. By definition, IoT is a term that means the time in our history when there were more devices or things connected to the Internet than there were people. Researchers have determined that phenomenon occurred sometime around 2008-2009, you see here on the timeline. There's also the industrial Internet of Things, which is really just a subset of IoT, but for manufacturing, which is really where most of us, you know, butter our bread, right? The term smart manufacturing is a is a US led initiative comprised of a coalition of very prominent manufacturers who uh, are developing related technologies. One of those, Rockwell, has a vision for what they call the smart factory of tomorrow, and it's called the connected enterprise. And if you go to their website or if you talk to some people on the Rockwell team or see their literature, you will see that term quite often. There's also Industry 4.0, which is the German government's initiative to digitize uh, uh, manufacturing. It's also a reference to the fourth industrial revolution. So to say that there is a fourth industrial revolution suggests that there were three that preceded it. Well, what do they look like? Let's take a trip back in time and see. We know the origins of pneumatics can be traced back to the first century when an ancient Greek mathematician named Hero of Alexandria wrote about inventions that powered <clears throat> inventions powered by air and wind and steam. In the 1600s, a German physicist named Otto von Guerich invented the vacuum pump. Then in 1678, this guy, Blaise Pascal, uh, discovered that a pressure exerted on a confined fluid will transmit uh, equally and unilaterally in all directions. We now know that's the basis for hydraulics. Right? And then in 1876, uh, Alexander Graham Bell uttered the famous words, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. And of course, we had the telephone. A few years later in 1879, Thomas Alva Edison invented the light bulb. And then in 1947, the first blip on our timeline, Walter Bretain and John Bardeen, his partner, working at AT&T Bell Laboratories, invented this revolutionary device. So before I go there, think back. Think back to what you think might have been invented in 1947 that would be so important. I'll tell you. Known more commonly these days as a MOSFET or metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. But before the transistor, we used these. Vacuum tubes. These things work really well. Uh, you can still get them, as a matter of fact. Some older, like, uh, you know, stereo amplifier technology uses this stuff. But they required higher operating voltages, and they generated a lot more heat. And because of that, they failed a whole lot more often than the transistors that would eventually replace them. Did I mention that they were a whole lot uh, smaller uh, than a vacuum tube? So to better understand the significance of the transistor's place in industrial automation history, let's Google IoT and let's see what it says. So this is the Wikipedia page for Industrial Internet of Things. If we scroll down to the first section titled History, the fourth paragraph, first sentence, we will see that the tiny transistor was the cornerstone invention, either directly or indirectly, for the majority of the technologies and inventions that we all enjoy these days. That tiny transistor paved the way for the microprocessor. That led to the CPUs running in all of our intelligent devices. And that led to the processors or the brains of every computer on the planet, past, present, and future. Well, I think you get the big picture about the tiny transistor. Now, what I want to do is take a look at what happened in 1968, all right? So let's go here. So we owe Dick Morley uh, a huge debt of gratitude, believe it or not, for two very specific reasons. First, he founded a company called Bedford & Associates, and he also, this guy loved to drink, all right? So first, I want to tell you the Bedford uh, & Associates story. So 
Back when the microprocessor came out and was replacing the vacuum tube technology, uh, Dick Morley realized that a lot of the manufacturing plants, especially the big three automakers in the U.S., were using this older, antiquated, troublesome, problematic vacuum tube technology. So he knew that the transistor and the microprocessors that came with them would be a great way to replace that technology. So he and uh, uh, engineers got together, formed Bedford Associates in Bedford, Connecticut, and they were making uh, a, basically a black box. And that black box contained the proprietary code, the necessary hardware to replace that vacuum tube technology in manufacturing plants. The problem was that it was not easy to troubleshoot a problem for the customers. So the, the engineers and the technicians and the maintenance people at automotive plants, for example, they did not have the, the expertise to troubleshoot this stuff. So that required Dick and his team of engineers going out in the field to troubleshoot problems and update code and things like that. And that prevented them from developing newer technology. Well, this was a real problem for Dick, and he knew he had to find a resolution. It just so happened that on New Year's Eve of 1967, he, along with friends and family and colleagues, went out to ring in the new year, and the dude got trashed. He woke up the next morning with a horrendous hangover, and while he was nursing that hangover, he was thinking about these problems that were waiting on him at work the next day. And he started thinking of ways to resolve those. And long story short, he came up with a new design, a new hardware platform that was more modular, but he also came up with something that we now know as ladder logic. It would be a graphical interface between the code that was actually written by his engineers to make everything work. It was also gonna be easier to troubleshoot because it was going to look like and mimic the same electrical schematics that maintenance people and engineers in the manufacturing plants in the US were used to seeing. So what Dick did was he named his new invention the modular digital controller. And then when they tried to figure out a name for their new sister company they wanted to start because of this new idea that Dick had, they decided to call it Modicon, right? So this picture is a picture of Dick Morley there on the left with some of his engineering buddies. And this is actually one of the first commercially successful uh, modular digital controllers that they designed. You can see it says Modicon there on the black box. These racks are input and output cards. But uh, this was one of the first industrial controllers that was really uh, easy to troubleshoot, right? Modicon has since been purchased by Schneider Electric, in case you're wondering. But since the term modular digital controller had way too many syllables, Modicon originally decided to call their product a programmable controller. And this is how they refer to it as a PC. But that was being confused with the personal computer, which was also entering uh, the market space. And there were also other industrial companies that were rapidly entering the same programmable controller market space because they liked the idea that Dick Morley and his engineers had come up with at Bedford and Associates. And one of those competitors decided to call theirs a PLC. I think we all probably know what a PLC is these days, a programmable logic controller. So what you've got to realize, guys, at this time in history, the PLC market was exploding. It quickly became a multi-billion dollar market in a matter of a few short years. So back in the 60s and early 70s, that was a big deal. So now let's take a look at what happened in 1973. While pursuing a doctorate in computer science, Robert Metcalf took a job with MIT after Harvard, his alma mater, which is where he obtained his undergrad in electrical engineering, refused to let him be responsible for connecting the school's computers to the brand new ARPANET. Now, if you don't know what the ARPANET is, it was the precursor to what we now know as the internet, and it was developed by the Department of Defense so that they could connect their computers and exchange data back and forth. Right? So at MIT, Metcalf was responsible for building some of the hardware that would link MIT's mini computers with the ARPANET. ARPANET was initially the topic of his dis uh, doctoral dissertation, but the first version was not accepted. His inspiration for a new thesis came while working at Xerox, where he read a paper about the Aloha Network at the University of Hawaii. Now, Metcalf identified and fixed some of the bugs in the Aloha Net model, and he made his analysis part of a 254-page revised thesis, which he titled 
packet communications. Now that eventually earned Metcalf his Harvard PhD in 1973. But the big takeaway here, guys, is that this is, uh, is that Metcalf's thesis paper laid the foundation for what would forever be known as Ethernet. Okay. Metcalf was working at Xerox in 73 when he and a guy named David Box coined the term Ethernet, initially as a standard for connecting computers over short distances. Now, Metcalf identified the day Ethernet was born as May 22nd of 1973, which was the same day that he circulated a memo to his colleagues, which contained a rough schematic of how it would all work. That is the first time in history that the term Ethernet appeared as a word, all right? But Let's be clear, Ethernet is not to be confused with the intranet. Ethernet is a term used to define the compatible standards and the underlying technologies that allow the internet to function in the manner that we all use it today. And since computers, including those ubiquitous smartphones that we all seem to tote these days, must use a standard for interconnection, this is where Ethernet comes in. All right. And also the term Ethernet is used to refer to a network of computers as well. So therefore, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Ethernets all over the world. But there's only one Internet. Right. On the hills of Metcalf's seminal thesis paper, uh, he connected the Xerox computers at their Palo Alto Research Center with those at DEC and Intel, which were not, located not too far away. And of course, he did it all using his and David Box Ethernet protocol for the first time ever. So this monumental achievement caught the attention of the IEEE, which is an international consortium of electrical and electronic engineers. And that group of engineers quickly approved this as a global standard for communications of all connected digital devices. They actually cited article number 802.3, which is still in use today. So to add some perspective uh, as to how far the Ethernet protocol has evolved since then, back in 73, the transmission rate uh, was just shy of 3 million bits per second, uh, which is what we refer to as bandwidth. And today, it's over 40 trillion, to put it in perspective. So spoiler alert for those of you trying to do that math in your head right now, that's an increase of about 1,300% in bandwidth during that period of time. It's pretty impressive. Okay, uh, now for a word from our sponsor. Okay, not really. Uh, but I do have a couple of quick housekeeping items I think I should cover first. Uh, you can file these under industrial automation tribal knowledge. So first, there are a few notable standards organizations maintaining a keen sense of checks and balances in regards to all things ethernet based. I've already name dropped the IEEE. I'm gonna to refer to a couple more later on in this presentation. We also use these two terms quite a bit. So think of protocol as a language, uh, our set of rules for communicating between two or more devices, just like we all understand the nuances of the English language, and that's what we're using to communicate. At least we would have and we'd have turned your mics on. Um, and think of a gateway as an interpreter between two or more languages or protocols in this case. So data would be the value content that's contained in that particular language uh, that's being exchanged between two or more, more nodes on a network. And uh, nodes would be the devices or the things that are physically connected on that network, right? And a network would be the physical medium for sharing their data, even if it's wireless, right? Wireless is actually a, a medium. So now let's fast forward to 1979. Remember Dick Morley and his modular digital controller from a decade earlier? Well, it has evolved into this Modicon PLC, right? And they developed the first ever industrial communications protocol, and they called it, surprise, surprise, Modbus. Now, Modbus was the first ever, uh, but believe it or not, while it is antiquated, it is still in use. I think because they were the first one to market, uh, it's not uncommon for me and our tech team at Scott Equipment to field Modbus related questions. As a matter of fact, uh, one of our newest products, which we promote, 
which is CASO robots or collaborative robots. Uh, it has an Ethernet port on the front, but on the side, it also has a Modbus port just for Modbus communications for putting it on a Modbus network. I know they even have like um, drivers just for Modbus available on their website. But not to be outdone, these guys also had a card to play. I'm sure y'all have seen this logo before. So during the previous decade, the PLC market was continuing to explode. And now it was a $10 billion plus industry with Alan Bradley becoming a major player. And just a couple of months after Modbus was introduced, Alan Bradley rolled out their first ever industrial protocol called Data Highway. And believe it or not, I still go places where I see the, the blue Data Highway cables connecting uh, Alan Bradley devices. Stuff's obsolete and you can only get some of the replacement parts on eBay, but the stuff is still around. I actually went into a Volvo plant in the Shenandoah Valley a couple of years ago and boom, there it was. But something else was also happening down in Houston during this same time, which would dramatically impact both Allen Bradley as well as Modicon PLC. The space race. So uh, for those of you old enough to remember uh, back then, uh, the uh, US and Russia were truly in a space race of sorts to put the first person on the moon. Of course, we all know that Neil Armstrong uh, was the first man to do that back in July 20th of 1969. But uh, the significance of that is NASA really wanted to integrate industrial control technology into um, um, the space shuttle program. So they let a variety of companies bid on all the automation necessary to make all that work. And while Modicon bid on that, uh, Alan Bradley did as well, as well as a bunch of other companies. And the person or the company that actually uh, won that, uh, that bid was Alan Bradley. And the rest, as they say, is history. So now let's fast forward a decade and take a look at the 80s and see what happened next. So by 1980, the year I graduated high school, every PLC manufacturer was rapidly developing their own proprietary industrial protocols for digital com communications of all connected devices. And on the heels of winning the NASA contract a decade earlier, Alan Bradley up in Milwaukee became the most dominant force in the Western Hemisphere. First, they developed their Data Highway that I mentioned earlier. Then they followed that up with Data Highway Plus. That was followed by ControlNet. After that, they had something called CompoNet, which is still around. And then by the end of the decade, they had the ever popular device net protocol. And over in Europe, Siemens was doing something very similar with Profibus. Now, let's hop over to the 90s and check that out. So with so many PLC manufacturers continuing to enter this market space with each of them developing their own unique protocols, controls engineers, which is what I used to be, uh, were stymied as to why they had to keep learning these new languages every time a new one rolled out. They really wanted standardization to ease the burden and also to reduce the development time of the user programs, which was always necessary to make a PLC work in an application. Well, this got the attention of the IEC, which is another group of engineers who create standards for these types of technologies. So IEC stands for International Electrotechnical Commission, and they're truly a global consortium. I'll show you a map here. As you can see by this map, the dark blue are uh, the members, the light blue are the affiliates. And of course, there's some couple of rogue nations like North Korea, Somalia, Morocco, uh, Liberia, and Uzbekistan, I believe people who just for some reason can't play well with others but they're the outliers here but as you can see the majority of the world adheres to these IEC standards that have been developed over time so another thing they did was they listened to what all the controls engineers were complaining about and thought you know it would be great if we had some some standards for software that's used for user programs at the PLC level. So what they did was they created standards, uh, uh, it's called 61131-3, which in a, in a nutshell means ladder diagram, functional block diagram, structure text, which is a text-based, as well as instruction list, text-based. These things can all be uh, used together. And PLC manufacturers were strongly encouraged by the IEC and this article number they assigned to it, so that if you knew how to use uh, 
Alan Bradley's PLC software, you should be able to easily go learn Siemens or Mitsubishi's or Omron's or someone else's, provided, of course, they adhere to this IEC 611.31-3 compliancy. And most of them did, by the way. It made it life much easier for controls engineers, and it took much less time to deploy uh, PLCs and applications as a result of this because the learning curve wasn't nearly as steep. So in 1994, the OPC Foundation was created as a multi-vendor task force with the purpose of creating basic specs for related technologies. And today, the OPC Foundation cooperates with other organizations like the IEEE and the IEC who share similar missions and visions of what industrial automation should look like moving forward. The OPC Foundation has a well-established qualification process called the OPC Enhanced Certification Program, which just means that things like data access, historical data, uh, complex data and commands, as well as alarms and events, all have the same commonality. So again, it, uh, it makes it easy to go from one platform to the other and accomplish a task relatively seamlessly. Now, let's take a look at what happened after Y2K. So thanks to IT uh, for our information technologies, which was created because of Metcalf's Ethernet protocol, we now also have something called OT for operational technology. And operational technology is the hardware and software that detects or causes a change to industrial automation equipment. And the term was established to demonstrate the technological and functional differences between traditional IT systems and its industrial counterparts, all right? So along with that came industrial ethernet, right? So instead of having these proprietary protocols, which were unique to the, to the vendor who, who created it, now they were all embracing this uh, IEEE 802.3 protocol, but with some nuances. So if I equate industrial ethernet, or just ethernet, say to the English language, which I've already uh, used as an analogy, Think of it like uh, where, you know, I have a bit of a Southern accent. I've got friends up in the Northeast who have that, you know, that Northeast accent. I got friends from the Midwest who have that, that, you know, Midwestern, you know, Plains kind of uh, accent. So, but we all speak English, right? But we've all got our subtle uh, different dialects or, you know, something kind of colloquial. So that's really what happened with industrial ethernet. Many manufacturers came out with things like this. Uh, Modbus became Modbus TCP for, for Modbus TCP for Transmission Control Protocol, right? Then at Rockwell, uh, who purchased Allen Bradley, uh, they evolved DeviceNet into Ethernet IP, an industrial Ethernet protocol. Over in Europe, you had Siemens. They took Profibus and evolved that into Profinet using the I uh, IEEE 802.3 standard, right? Then you had uh, Beckhoff created EtherCAT. This is a very popular protocol, by the way. Probably right now, one of the most popular protocols is the one that has the most bandwidth. Uh, matter of fact, just to make it, uh, I guess, to drive home that point, I know that Toyota Manufacturing, uh, about two years ago now, who had standardized on Ethernet IP, they made a switch from Ethernet IP to EtherCAT solely because it had more bandwidth, right? As you try to put more and more devices on the network, Bandwidth becomes an issue, as we now know, right? Then, of course, you had uh, Mitsubishi evolved into CC Link IE for industrial Ethernet. You had uh, MNR over in Europe, who competes with Beckhoff, develop uh, PowerLink, another industrial Ethernet protocol. And finally, we had Circos. And Circos was an Ethernet-based protocol just for motion apps. Then, in 2013, something truly extraordinary happened. Okay. So before I tell you what that is, though, I want to explain something. So on paper, this is what a manufacturing plant's control scheme might look like. You have uh, an enterprise resource planning software uh, that's, uh, that refers to the type of software that organ uh, organizations use to manage day-to-day -day business activities, right? Then you have manufacturing execution systems, the MES software shown here in yellow, right? Those are used to track and document the transformation of raw materials all the way to finished goods. And then you have SCADA, which is an acronym for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, which is a computer system used for gathering and analyzing real-time data, 
right? So then you have the PLC and sensors and actuators. But all of these, including the PLCs, were now communicating over some Ethernet protocol. But what about these sensors and actuators down here on the plant floor, right? Those things weren't so good at speaking Ethernet. And in reality, the control schemes function more like what you see here on the screen. Regardless of what it looked like on paper, this is really what it felt like to the people trying to deploy these systems down on the plant floor. The bottom line was that it was impossible to get real-time data to and from field devices like sensors and actuators in the, in the current form that existed at that time in history. But that is when something truly revolutionary happened, right? Along comes IO-Link. I'm sure y'all have heard this term by now. It's been around for a while. This was originally developed by Siemens, but Siemens realized that IO-Link was the final piece to a puzzle to solve that problem, right? So instead of keeping this to themselves and making everyone buy it from Siemens, they approached the IEC with a novel idea. Let a governing body control the IO-Link protocol in the same manner that Ethernet had been fo had fostered in the growth of IT-based technologies. And on September 11th of 2013, the IEC assigned the dash nine suffix to that same 61131 standard for PLC programming that had been established previously. So what I'm showing you here is really just uh, what a, an IO-Link uh, master, which would be this module in the PLC rack or the IO-Link master could be this one over here to the, to the right of that, uh, like an IP67 or IP69K um, um, block, right? So what these are, this rack, in the, this module in the rack in the PLC and what you see here to the right of that, those are effectively gateways. This is a gateway between whatever industrial Ethernet protocol your PLC is communicating over, be it Ethernet IP or EtherCAD or Profinet or whatever it is, down to the IO-Link protocol down at the sensor and the actuator level. So um, the IO-Link chipsets were designed to be simpler to integrate, and they were also much less expensive to manufacture than Ethernet chipsets. So this made it much more suitable for the actuators and sensors down at the machine level. And again, as I mentioned before, the IO-Link masters were gateways between the, this new IO-Link protocol and whatever industrial protocol that was being used by the PLCs. So to add some perspective as to how rapidly the IO-Link protocol is evolving, this picture you see on the screen was a list of the manufacturers who were official IO-Link affiliates back in 2018 when I first put together this presentation to help tell the story. And this is what it looks like two years later. I updated this uh, last year, 2020, uh, back during the pandemic. I was bored one day and thought it could use some updating. And I realized they were, I think, about 44% more when I counted them up, 44% more manufacturers who were affiliates with IO-Link. And I'm sure if you, if you look at this, you're going to see a bunch of uh, familiar names, like you'll see Murr and, of course, SMC and uh, MTS Temposonics and Balmer and Datalogic and, you know, a whole host of others. But their bottom line and the takeaway here, guys, is there's a lot of manufacturers who are embracing the IO-Link protocol. I realize it hasn't quite taken off yet, uh, but there are companies who are really starting to uh, take a long look at this. So uh, here are the advantages of IO-Link, all right? So simple, non-shielded cabling out to 60 feet. You can get this cabling uh, not only from Amazon, but this is the simple, the same kind of a, a five conductor cable as you would use for connecting the same sensor technologies, which we use in manufacturing plants today. It's not proprietary at all. It's not a Cat5 or a Cat6 cable or anything like that. Nothing special about it. Only the number of wires in the right gauge. Um, also, it's smart device technology. So what I mean by smart device technology is this. Um, let me use SMC as examples. So I know that SMC, uh, they make a DMP sensor for their pneumatic cylinders. And the beauty of that product is, is you can actually slide it into the grooves on the cylinders and you can detect the position of that magnet that's on the diaphragm of that, uh, that uh, pneumatic actuator. Uh, so as it moves, we can use that DMP sensor to detect the position of the uh, pneumatic uh, actuator. But with IO-Link, we get some additional functionality. They've embedded other technologies, like I know they uh, have added temperature sensors to that. So what is cool about that is, so while we, we can also monitor the position of the actuator, we can also use the IO-Link technology and the smart, devi uh, smart device technology to also monitor the temperature. And why that's important is this. 
just say uh, that particular pneumatic uh, cylinder has to be lubed from time to time. Well, what happens when you don't adhere to, um, you know, the, the manufacturer's recommended uh, uh, preventive maintenance cycle and you don't lube it often enough? Well, it starts generating heat. Well, we use temperature sensors to detect whether or not it's actually exceeded some threshold there. So in addition to monitoring the position of the, uh, the actuator by virtue of this DMP sensor you can get from SMC, we can also monitor the temperature as well. So whoever's programming the PLC can now set thresholds for these so you can do predictive maintenance. That's the beauty of uh, this increased data and diagnostics, the smart device technology. So have you ever heard someone say, hey, there's an app for that? Well, this remote configuration monitoring is just that. For many of these smart devices, which is really what we're talking about, there truly are apps for those things. So it used to be in the past, you had to go out, you know, find a manual for that product and go out to the product in the field, press some buttons, you know, and try and figure out how to configure that product. Well, now most of these things we can communicate with over the same internet, using the same ethernet protocol we've already talked about, to use an app on a tablet or a smartphone to do remote configuration and even monitoring of these same smart devices. It's all because it's IO-Link and how it works, right? And also, last but not least, simple device replacement, which is probably my favorite aspect of all this. So the beauty of this is if it's an IO-Link compliant device, it comes with an IODD file for uh, IO de device definition file. And what we do there is when we actually install that uh, IO-Link product, onto an I.O. Link Master uh, gateway, we, uh, as soon as we plug it in, the I.O. Link Master records whatever set points, whatever data are on that device, records them and saves them on, in, in memory on the I.O. Link Master. Now, what's nice about this is if for some reason, say the SMC DMP uh, sensor, it just fails. Maybe somebody bumped it with a fork truck. It's not working, right? You got to go replace it. Well, in the past, that meant somebody had to go not only get it out of inventory or get it ordered and there at the manufacturer and installed and plugged in, it also meant a technician or a maintenance person or an engineer had to go out there and physically reconfigure that product. But the beauty of this is with IO-Link and the way it works, once you plug that replacement IO-Link device into the same port on the IO-Link master, it immediately, as soon as it powers up, it pushes the set point data back down to the IO-Link device. So uh, it's up and running in a matter of seconds and not minutes or hours that we're accustomed to. So I know that companies like um, Newcore Steel and Michelin Tire are investing heavily in IO-Link all because they really desire ultimately to do one thing, and that is to reduce downtime, because we know downtime costs some places lots of money. I, I know from working at a Nissan plant in Smyrna, Tennessee several years back, they claimed that downtime cost them $10,000 per minute when they weren't pumping cars out the, uh, you know, out the back door, right? So downtime costs money, and the beauty of IOLink is ultimately at the end of the day, it's designed to help reduce that same downtime. So remember this model from a moment ago? Well, now because of IO-Link, it's starting to look more like this with terms like cloud computing and big data beginning to enter our collective consciousness. IO-Link was the final piece that enabled the real-time machine data to quickly and easily be absorbed and analyzed back up at the IT level. So today we have the OPC Foundation asking this question, though. If we now have a universal IO-Link protocol that isn't tied to a manufacturer, why do we still have industrial Ethernet protocols that are designed and maintained by manufacturers of those products and technologies? So furthermore, why not have just one universal industrial Ethernet protocol supported by all manufacturers equally and unilaterally? Well, actually, we do. These are the companies who have agreed to support that same initiative. And this has been in works for almost two years now. Matter of fact, this screenshot was one from an article I found to be November of 2019, so almost two years ago. And it was about this very subject. So that new industrial Ethernet protocol, by the way, is called OPCUA. Uh, the UA stands for United Architecture, and it's being asked about more and more. And it's only a matter of time before OPCUA will replace many, if not all, of the industrial Ethernet protocols 
that are being used today, like Ethernet IP and EtherCAT and Profinet. So what else is there on the horizon? If we're in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, is there a fifth one looming? Well, yes, there is. And actually, we're already there. And while the term robot was coined exactly 100 years ago, the term collaborative robot was patented in 1994. And now cobots are allowing workers and smart technology to coexist together in the same work environments to perform complicated tasks much more easily. This tweet, humans are underrated, went out about two years ago when Elon Musk attempted to address the production issues at his innovative car plant out in the Arizona desert. But Elon Musk went on to say this. He realized that the need for a computer literate workforce who had the knowledge to adapt to the new work environment. He also recognized that those workers were in very much in short supply. So to recap, the first industrial revolution was about machines that harness the power of natural resources like air and wind. Then the second revolution, was wrapped around how we use that newfangled electricity to automate production lines. Guys like Henry Ford rode this wave really, really well. Then the third industrial revolution occurred thanks to that tiny transistor and all those technologies that followed it. As I've already mentioned, we use these technologies every single day and we now take them for granted. This one was all about going digital and being smart about it. I don't know about y'all, but I enjoy the fact that I use apps on my phone to monitor and control smart appliances in my home when I'm not here, right? Uh, for example, uh, I have a, a smart TV, I have a smart fridge now, I have a smart oven. So my smart oven, if I'm away and I know I want to come home and maybe my wife and I want to put a frozen pizza in because we're going to be in a hurry, we've got things to do, I can turn my oven on before I get home using an app on my phone. And if, for example, maybe I leave in a hurry in the morning and I, I don't shut my, uh, my refrigerator door very well. I can get pinged by an app on my phone to let me know, hey, my refrigerator door's not shut and my milk's going to spoil before I get home. So I can call my neighbor and have them come over and shut the door for me, right? So and I've got a list of things like this, stories I've told over the, I've learned over the past couple of years from using smart devices. But I mean, that's really the takeaway here, right? We have this technology. The lights in my office here, the ones I use here for my home studio, I can control these things over the internet, even if I'm not here. If I leave the house and recognize home and I forgot to turn my lights off, I can take an app on my phone and I can turn all those lights off or I can just dim them, all right? So that's just a, some good examples of smart technology and smart devices. So, and this fifth wave of technology is all about the personal touch and how much the workforce is evolving. This is also the reason why manufacturers are clamoring for people with associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees in mechatronics engineering. And it's a field of study which didn't even exist a decade ago. Personally, I find all of this fascinating and I hope you do too. So in closing, if we at Scott Equipment can assist you in any way, then just let us know. We'd be glad to help. Thanks again for listening and I hope this was time well spent. Have a great day.